This is Gilbert Gottfried, and this is Gilbert Gottfried's amazing, colossal podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre. Our guest this week is a TV writer, documentary filmmaker, and author with credits that include Simon and Simon, Murder, She Wrote, and Sliders. He's written and produced documentaries on everyone from Elvis to Shemp Howard, and as a voice artist, has contributed to animated specials including Frosty Returns and You're in the Super Bowl, Charlie Brown. In 1974, when he was just 19 years old, he went to work for the legendary Groucho Marx, an experience he writes about in his book, Raised Eyebrows, My Years Inside Groucho's House, soon to be a major motion picture directed by filmmaker Rob Zombie. Welcome to the show, Steve Stolyer. Thank you. A pleasure to be here. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for doing it. Sure. Well, it's nice to speak to you from from beyond the grave. <laughs> I was under the impression that I was going to be speaking with Arthur Godfrey. <laughs> And I don't, I don't hear anyone playing a ukulele or anything remotely resembling a ukulele. How, how are you? How are you? <laughs> That's Arthur Godfrey. Yeah. Did you, uh, you realize that a lot of the pictures we did was because Chico needed the money? <laughs> oh, that's our catchphrase. Chico needed a lot more than just money, but Hoppo and I couldn't provide those specific services. <laughs> This Hello. Is, this is Dueling surreal. Groucho's. It's surreal. Bang, 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 bang. You, you, huh. I got to tell you, you know, I care about the ecology, but not about the Jews. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to save the whales, but I don't care about any of the Jews surviving. <laughs> Thank you, Arthur Gottfried. <laughs> I never heard you do Arthur Godfrey. That's pretty damn good. There's a good. big demand for that. Yeah. yeah, well, the kids go crazy. The kids what? go crazy for that, and they stop me on the street corner to ask me to do my Bennett Surf impression. <laughs> <laughs> Are you currently appearing on Broadway in a play involving a small child or a citrus fruit of some sort? <laughs> There's a big demand for that. How's your Percy Helton? <laughs> Not as good as his Percy Kilbride. Oh, well. We'll have dueling no. Percys sometimes. No, I, I specialize in my John MacGyver. You got a good strong back? <laughs> Joe Buck, you're That's going it. to need it, boy. Just get on your knees and pray. I want quiet here. <laughs> quiet. Twilight, Everything though. is just too noisy. <laughs> when I was a child, I liked to eat more brownies because <laughs> cookies were too noisy. <laughs> All the greats. How's it, John Carradine? I took uh, the brain of a lesbian and put it into the body of a man from the telephone company, and they call me mad. <laughs> That's wonderful. Everything you wanted to know about sex. That That's it. And, you know, I think Lon Chaney Jr. auditioned for that part. Woody Allen himself told me that Chaney auditioned for that. He said, Chaney, Chaney said... I have cancer, and then Woody said to me, that's his specialty. <laughs> and then he said that Cheney was, said he was only good until 3 in the afternoon, and Woody had to tell him, I'm sorry, but I can't work under those circumstances. And, you know, I think Carradine made a better mad scientist. Oh, yeah. Uh, Cheney, Cheney, of course, was fine in, in Mice and Men. Well, Lenny will have a little farm and we'll raise... <laughs> And I get to tend them. Yes, Lenny, you'll get to tend them. 
<laughs> but at least we're sticking to the point, which is Groucho Marx, and yes. that's the important thing. Well, speaking of uh, everything you always uh, want to know uh, about sex, I, I, don't, I, I don't like this place, George. <laughs> Come on, George. <laughs> Let's move out of here. Lenny, remember what I told you. If anything goes bad, you remember where to go and hide, don't you, Lenny? Ah, uh, ah, uh, right behind the bushes by the pond. That's it. If anything goes bad, you wait there for me. Hey, you tell me again how we'll have a farm with <laughs> rabbits. Oh, now, on it. Lenny, we've been through that a hundred times. I'm tired of telling you about the rabbis. Uh, the rabbis. <laughs> oh, they're, they're just like priests, only they're for the Jews. <laughs> Tell me about the Jews, George. <laughs> well, of course, they did something terrible 2,000 years ago. And they've been persecuted mercilessly since then. <laughs> tell, tell me again how they killed Christ. Well... <laughs> They said th there was this fellow named Pilates. <laughs> and you've probably seen some of his shops around town. And then there were 30 pieces of silver and Judas betrayed Christ <laughs> with a kiss. No tongues. <laughs> Good heavens, what are we wow. doing here? <laughs> it's like the old show, The Copycats. Oh, with, yes. With Gorshin and... <laughs> Well, you had mentioned everything was, you always want to know about sex, so I was going to say there's a segue since the, the it infamous Aaron Fleming. It would have been Aaron if we had sidetracked ourselves. Yes, Aaron <laughs> Fleming Aaron Fleming was in the scene uh, in which Tony Randall uh, is in the control room of, uh, of the erection. Can I say erection on your podcast? No, say hard dick. Yeah. Say yes. hard I think that was what soldiers had in their backpack <laughs> during World War I. It was called hard dick. Or Say I think. big throbbing cock. <laughs> I don't like the term That erection. sounds like a British estate. <laughs> I, I could be located at three big throbbing cock, wart upon the nose, London. <laughs> wow. Wait, what were we talking? Oh, oh. So, Aaron yes, Fleming. Aaron Fleming was in that, and then she was supposed to be in... Uh, love and death she was going to play that countess that woody seduces but aaron according to aaron she stormed off the set because woody wouldn't agree to allow her character to have children and aaron was obsessed with wanting a child so she came back from europe you know thinking we would admire how she stood up to that woody allen and, you know, she essentially screwed herself out of what would have been a plum role for her and, and probably the, uh, the, only other, the only other significant role she had, except that she was in Hercules in New York, starring oh, Arnold oh, Schwarzenegger yeah. and Arnold Stang. We've talked about yes. that one. That, that's Arnold. where Arnold Stang talks like this. <laughs> Arnold Strong, they built Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah. 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 has yeah, a voice like this. They dubbed it in. And you can see Aaron running around saying, no, Zeus, no, you must not do this to Hercules. Show mercy, Zeus. She now, was, it rocketed her from local to worldwide obscurity. Now, the only thing that people seem to agree when yes. they talk about uh, Aaron Fleming is that, that she was nuts. Well, <laughs> well, Lenny, um... She, Tell uh, me how Erin Fleming was not, George. Well, she was <laughs> diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. You wouldn't understand <laughs> words like that. She was, she was a very volatile human being, and I was only 19 years old when I got the job and had never had to work with anyone like that. And she could be, you know, the sweetest person in the world one day and then just a bat out of hell the next day. And you never were quite sure what was going to set her off. There would be something that you would think, oh, no, when Aaron hears about this, she's going to be hell on wheels. And she would laugh it off. And then there would be something else completely innocuous. And she would just have a colossal shit fit and throw things and break things and scream and slam doors. Uh, but the Aaron Fleming subject is a complicated one because she came along at a time in Groucho's life when his family was not particularly interested 
in looking after him. Um, he had recently been divorced for the third time and was just kind of rattling around in his house up in Beverly Hills doing occasional, doing the Dick Cavett show and game shows and different guest spots. And Aaron came along initially as his secretary and, and picked him up and dusted him off and thrust him out into the spotlight, which neatly split his friends because half of them thought it was wonderful that Groucho should hear that kind of adulation from the baby boomers at that point in his life. And then the other part of his friends who felt that Groucho was too frail to have a spotlight thrown on him. And so, you know, as they say, the color of truth is gray. She, she extended his life, but made it a much, much rockier road than it needed to have been because of her volatile personality. That's the short answer to your question. <sighs> and now the first day you were working for Groucho, you were 19 years old, a nervous mm -hmm. little kid, and he had just had a stroke then like you uh it was actually it wasn't the first day but it was only a few weeks after i started working there and i was just finally starting to get get used to the fact that i was working inside his house and that authorities weren't going to grab me by the collar and say we're very sorry young man but a terrible mistake has been made and i i i leapt up the steps and rang the bell and uh, the maid answered and said, please be very quiet. Mr. Marx has had a stroke. And I thought, oh, no, this is this is it. The uh, the pumpkin, you know, that had turned into a coach is going to switch back into a pumpkin. And I went down the hall expecting to see him lying on his bed, unable to move and unable to speak. And instead he was he was sitting on his bed, propped up, reading the newspaper, wearing PJs and his mucklucks. And he said, uh, is the ambulance here yet? And I said, no, it figures. And it, it was just, I mean, it was so matter of fact, the way he just approached, it's like, well, here's my latest stroke, and I'm sure there'll be more. And he did bounce back from that uh, and, and lived almost another three years. But at the time, it was pretty scary because I thought that this dream job that I had, and I did, I used to have dreams about meeting Groucho and then would wake up terribly frustrated that it was only a dream. So when I was able to meet him, I said, Groucho, I'm very happy to be meeting you after all this time. And he said, well, you should be. And uh, <laughs> Aaron Fleming said, this is Steve. He's the young man who's trying to get animal crackers re-released. And Groucho said, did you get it? And I said, not yet, but we're working on it. And he said, you better or I'll fire you. And I said, well, I didn't realize I was working for you. How much money are you paying me? And he said, a little less than nothing. So that was before I had the job. But that was how we met, was trying to get animal crackers off the shelf, which was successful. And it was this labor of love for me to get this movie seen. It's very gratifying now when I run into people who say, oh, Animal Crackers was the first Marx Brothers movie I ever saw, or I have it on DVD, or I watched it last Thursday. Because when we were growing up, it was the great missing link in the Marx Brothers dozen films, because it had been made for Paramount in 1930, and then when the Paramount films were sold to Universal in the late 50s, it was included, but the rights had, had expired and reverted back to the original authors, and MCA didn't think there was any money to be had by clearing the rights and reissuing this lost Marx Brothers film. But all of my friends were Marx Brothers fanatics and wanted to see it. So I started this petition drive at UCLA to put pressure on Universal to clear the rights, and that's when Groucho came to campus, and I sat side by side you know, pinching myself and firmly convinced that this was it, that I would never get to see him again, but I should be grateful that there he was talking to me and all these newsmen. And then the film came out and broke the box office record at the UA Westwood that had been set by French Connection, and that was colossally gratifying. And then I had, there were two summer jobs for 1974. Both of them fell through, for which I remain eternally grateful and uh, and I thought I had nothing to lose, so I called Aaron Fleming and I said, is there anything at all that you think could need 
doing the and she said well actually i had been groucho's secretary but now i'm his manager we need someone to handle the fan mail and to organize all of his memorabilia that's going to be donated to the smithsonian and in my mind's eye it's like a tex avery cartoon where i'm showing up on the doorstep before she hangs up the phone it wasn't quite like that uh i initially thought i'd be working in some some Wilshire Boulevard office building and maybe he'd come in twice a month or something and she said, oh no dear, you'll work right inside the house. There's a room that you could use as an office and you can come and go as you please and make your own hours. And I thought, and they're giving me money to do this to wade ankle deep in Groucho's memorabilia from vaudeville and Broadway <laughs> and Hollywood and to sit and have lunch with with George Burns and Steve Allen and, and Jack Lemon and Maury Riskind and Nat Perrin, got to meet S.J. Perelman, all these just extraordinary personages. I, I remember I saw Animal Crackers at a theater in New York when it first came out. Right, there was a re-premiere. There were, they had two re-premieres. One was in Westwood and the other was in New York where Groucho was almost trampled to death by the uh, the crowds that showed up to greet him, which on the one hand was very gratifying, and on the other hand is kind of scary when you're in your 80s and frail. Oh, yeah. When was that, Steve, when the movies were released? 74? Or, yeah. Uh, Animal Crackers? Yeah. And, yeah. and I, saw, I saw Groucho at Radio City. Really? Yeah. <clears throat> and I remember they, they bring out they uh they oh they brought out a violin to him and uh and they said it was like jack benny's violin oh, yeah. and he steps on it that was was that the carnegie hall show oh a, yeah carnegie hall i meant right. carnegie hall and it was they bring out jack benny's violin it's supposed right. to be and he uh drops it on the ground steps on it and goes right. uh I've had enough of Jack Penny, and so has this violin. Right. <laughs> was, Ham was that the Hamlish show that you saw, yeah. Gilbert? Yes, Was it yes. Marvin Hamlish, and he would come out and sing Captain Spaulding? And yes, yes, yes. And, and now this brings us to another topic. Yes. You were not crazy about composer Marvin Hamlish. <laughs> I was crazy about the work that he did and the music that he generated, but there was a charity event uh, where, where Groucho performed, and it was it was called A Day at the Races, and it was at some country club out here in L.A., and I got to go because I was part of the household. And Hamlish came out and sat down at the piano and said, uh, I'm going to auction off my performance. And he was he was waiting for this flood of big ticket bids to come in <laughs> for the thrill of hearing him play, you know, the way we were, whatever it was. And fifty dollars, seventy five dollars and a hundred dollars. <laughs> and I, it didn't get very high at all. And he was so upset that he rejected the winning bid and said, I'll play this for nothing, but I don't want your $100. And I remember sitting there thinking, it isn't your $100. It's going to go to whatever the charity is that's putting this on. So even though you're not getting what you thought you were worth, um, shouldn't you be grateful for anything? But, you know, I guess... Anyway, as a kid, that impressed me. Or it rubbed me the wrong way that he was rejecting this money that was supposed to be for charity because it wasn't what he thought his performance was worth. And there's a group of people that it's funny to think now are like the young kids yeah. over at Groucho's house. Oh, like, like Sally Kellerman yeah. and Elliot Gould. Yes. George yeah. Siegel, all these people. But yeah, Gordon. it was sort of like a, a, a Robert Altman film, uh, mostly because half of them had been in Robert Altman films. Most of them were Aaron Fleming's friends. Um, but she brought them into Groucho's circle. And she also, you know, she, she was a, enough of a savvy businesswoman that she realized the, the value of having him photographed with 
then current big stars like Elton John, and he became friendly with Alice Cooper. Uh, I didn't get to meet Alice there, but I think Groucho got a big kick out of him, uh, just the outrageousness of his performance, and and said something like, you know, you're going to bring vaudeville back single-handedly, or something <laughs> like that. So it was, but I was always drawn to Groucho's circle of friends. That they, it seemed to me, they were more down to earth. Um, they they were more comfortable with ha- having had their fame or whatever their you know the writers and directors people like that, and even I mean when when George Burns came to lunch I was very nervous, and uh, I got the door and he just breezed in and said, "Hi, you want to live a long time? Become an actor. You live to be an old man like Groucho and me. All right, let's eat." <laughs> They sat down at the lunch table, and, and, and because I was always welcome at the lunch table, it was very egalitarian. It wasn't like the help had to eat in the kitchen. So no matter who was coming over, it was uh, I was welcome at the table, and so I just sat there with both ears open constantly and then would sometimes run into the next room and jot down notes, which went into my book, Raised Eyebrows. And it was just astonishing you know, the, uh, watching, you know, Groucho and George. Remember, uh, it was at the Gaiety Theater in Chicago <laughs> because uh, you, you, I think Checo was banging the daughter of the man. That wasn't the Gaiety Theater. That was BFK's <laughs> Theater in Milwaukee because it was around the corner from the candy store where Harpo bought all the jelly beans. And, I, you know, I would just be sitting there thinking, I can't believe this This is going. And at the, I remember at the end of lunch, Burns took out a cigar and pushed it into the holder, and he said, I never smoke expensive cigars. All I care about is if it fits the holder. Milton Burrell pays $2 a piece for his cigars. If I paid that much, I'd go to bed with it before I smoke. (laughs) Tell us about when Mae West came over, Steve, as long as we're talking about that. Oh, that that reminds me of something when you said Mae West. It's... I I was once talking to Alice Cooper, and he said that Groucho and Mae West both attended one of his concerts together. He it's, took her as a date. <laughs> I yeah. never heard that. That's yeah. great. <laughs> I'm sure we'll be inconspicuous. Nobody's going <laughs> to. Look, someone's dressed up as Groucho Marx and Mae West coming to see Alice Cooper. I hadn't heard that, but it's certainly possible. He said he was the only person who knew them That's there. terrific. Like the audience uh, were, they had no idea Groucho uh, and Mae West. Well, Mae West came up and saw him sometime. She was, one night she came over, and Aaron Fleming was very nervous about it. And she said, Groucho, promise me you're going to be on your best behavior, which is the best way to get and anyone with a sense of humor when you tell them that is looking for ways to be, you know, a oh, yes. <laughs> jammer top. So I'm familiar with it. Yeah. So the, I've gotten West, in trouble a lot of times for being warned. Whatever right. Whatever, don't don't throw me in the briar patch, or yeah. don't touch the wet paint, or whatever the thing yes. is. Well, in this case, she admonished Groucho to not ask anything that would be uh, embarrassing or put her on the spot. So she walks in, and the first thing he says is, "What do you hear from Bill Fields?" Now, if you know, she and W. C. Fields made My Little Chickadee, and and as legend, and apparently the truth had it. They hated each other. Yes. Fields yep. and West hated yep. each other. They didn't speak to each other. They communicated by sending notes through an intermediary. So probably one of the worst things Groucho could have done was to say, what do you hear from Bill Fields? <laughs> and, all, and she just said, in your dreams, Groucho, in your dreams. <laughs> and, then, and, and then just a few minutes after that, he said, didn't they throw you in the pokey once? Which was she had been jailed because her play Sex was deemed to be obscene and was uh, she was temporarily arrested and put in jail. So inside of about 10 minutes, he had put her on the spot asking about <laughs> WC and the time she was arrested for indecency. But it didn't throw her and it was fine. Aaron really was the only one that felt agitated at all. Um, and then ha- uh, Harpo's son Bill was there uh, playing the piano and he played 
he played Frankie and Johnny and Mae West did this reciting of a body poem she had wrote called The Pleasure Man. And it was just uh, a remarkable evening. I mean, it was just like this Jurassic Park of Paramount comedy, the king and queen of early 30s Paramount comedy in the same room with me. Um, and that was just, you know, one of, of dozens of experiences I had there. It, it was like at Groucho's parties, it seemed like he and every one of his guests performed. He loved to perform. He never stopped performing. Sometimes the guests would would decline, which I sort of, as with Hamlet, I sort of held it against them because I thought, how much is it really asking of you? At, at his 85th birthday party, Liza Minnelli was there with her then-husband, Jack Haley Jr., and I, I remember sitting there thinking, wow, Dorothy's daughter married the Tin Man's son. This is very strange. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that always struck me as strange. Yeah, uh, and I and Bill Bill Marks Harpo's son started doing the introduction to Cabaret, and she just she shook her head, and he tried it again, and she just shook her head, and so they moved on. She didn't want to get up and sing, um, but sometimes people did or told jokes. Um, I remember Bob, Bob Hope came by on his way. To a Danny Tom. Now I'm going to say Danny Thomas, and I'm going to try to finish. It. <laughs> oh, you you no. know the show, huh, Steve? <laughs> no, no, I know the truth. <laughs> <laughs> it, anyway, that's a separate. <laughs> anyway, Bob Pope showed up on his way to some charity event in honor. <laughs> oh, now, oh. oh, now you've gone and done this. And I can't think. Uh, tell me uh, and, about Danny Thomas. <laughs> 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 He was what we call a coprophile. <laughs> Not like a copper penny, Lenny. It's quite different, although both are brown. And and, and, and he had a glass coffee table. It didn't end there, but I'm going to stop talking about this. Okay. Now. Anyway, Bob... <laughs> He's not taking the bait. Uh, no, but, but Danny Thomas... Anyway... <laughs> Oh, dear. Okay. Wipe that shit-eating grin off your face. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, kids. Okay. All right. Now, you're not going, instead of behavior, we're not going to see Mickey Mouse. We're going to turn right around and go back to the motel. So you two, you stop it now. All right. All right. <laughs> Bob Hope came by, and we thought, you know, this is really great because he's going to talk about what it's been like. Uh, knowing Groucho for all those years. And so, you know, he, he, he was there in a, in a tuxedo because he was really essentially on his way to the Danny Thomas event. And he looked at Groucho and said, this is a man who's been making me laugh for years. And, uh, no, I'm sorry, I got it backwards. Groucho said, this is a man who's been making me laugh. <laughs> and Hope said, you don't have to say that, Groucho. And Groucho said, if you weren't here, I wouldn't say it. <laughs> and Hope said, that's how... And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he said, you know, the thing about Danny Thomas is he's so religious, he has stained glass bifocals. And I remember sitting there thinking, he's testing out his Danny Thomas material on us before going to the testimonial. <laughs> he has this crowded house in honor of Groucho's 85th birthday. They've worked together off and on since the late 30s, probably. And he's trying out his Danny Thomas material on us. So that was what stood out from that was a little bit of banter. And then that Danny Thomas, he's so religious, he has stained glass bifocals. And oh, and I, I we got a little sidetracked, but when a little, yeah, yeah <laughs> just a tad. When Groucho had that stroke and you were sitting there, how did uh, Aaron react? Ah, uh, funny you should ask. Yes. Yeah, well, so Groucho and his nurse and I were tending to him and getting him whatever he wanted, and this happened to have uh, taken place on Aaron's birthday, and there was going to be a birthday party that evening. Instead, she came in to the bedroom, she assessed the situation, saw Groucho lying there waiting for the ambulance, and uh, Steve and Nurse Julie looking up, smiling at her, kind of braving it out during this difficult moment. And she turned around and screamed, Oh, fuck! 
And then we heard a door <laughs> slam, and she didn't come out of her office at his house until the gurney had taken him away to, to Cedars. Then she came out of her office and came over, and I'm saying, you know, do you think he'll be okay? And her point of view was, do I think he'll be okay? He only did this to get attention. He only did this to upstage me because I'm having a birthday party, and now we can't have... And I said, Aaron, are you saying that you think he had this stroke on purpose? And she looked at me like, duh... Like, of course he had this on purpose. And her, her entire focus was on how his obviously unscheduled minor stroke had stolen the thunder for what was going to be her birthday party. So that's an example of what it was like trying to deal with someone who saw things through that bent prism of, of logic. And, and you had you were going out with a girl. Well. At, at, yeah, at that time uh, who was like i don't know like about 20 yes or Linda. something yeah and you split up you two split and then what happened then uh there, she and i were going to go out on a date and it was on a night when zeppo and gummo were coming up from palm springs they were the two extant marx brothers in addition to groucho never got to meet harpo or chico i'm sorry Never got to pay for any of Chico's bills or bailing him out financially or any other way. And, and, uh, and I wanted to meet, I wanted to, to have dinner with Zeppo and Gummo, but I said to Aaron, I, I have a date. And Aaron said, well, bring her. And I thought, oh, this th appealed to my wicked sense of humor because Linda was this very composed, uh, in the book I said she was unflappable and I was determined that she be flapped. So I picked her up, and she said, where are we going for dinner? And I said, it's a little out-of-the-way place. And we go wending our way through Truesdale Gates up Hillcrest. And she said, I don't want to do this. And I thought, well, we're going to do it. And she was a very attractive, she was, she was 19, uh, blonde hair, blue eyes, great personality. And Zeppo sort of became smitten with her over dinner. And then some And weeks, how old was Zeppo? She, uh, he was uh, all of 74. <laughs> Credible. And so she and I split up, and I thought, he's a guy that's been around the track once or twice. Maybe he has some advice for the lovelorn. So I had gotten a couple of pictures that I wanted him to sign, and in my cover letter, I said, you know, by the way, Linda and I split up. If you have any words of advice or whatever, I'd appreciate it. I get a long-distance call from the Tamarisk Country Club, uh, Steve at Zeppo Marks. How I, fine, fine. Listen, uh, uh, I, I hope I'm not stepping on your toes, uh, but uh, do you think that Linda would go out with me? <laughs> and I thought, this is really weird. I'm calling up to see if he can soothe my ruffled feathers. And he's hitting on... And I said, well, I don't know. I mean, she got a kick out of you and uh, because I'd never want to do uh, anything that you wouldn't approve of. You understand that? No, no. It's a, yeah, well, let me ask her. Oh, OK, uh, it, it, only if it's all right. So I called her up and she, too, thought it was kind of strange, charming. You know, it's like, sure, what the heck? I mean, and. They let me see. He took her to dinner in San Diego, and then a high ally game in Tijuana. Which of course, is anyone's that's anyone's standard first date in Los Angeles. I need to tell you, high ally with Zeppo dinner in San Diego, high ally in Tijuana, and then the next time I saw him, he said, "I want you to know, I never even kissed a goodnight, Steve. She's very, very nice, but really, all she did was talk about herself." And then I saw her on campus at UCLA, and she said, Zeppa was very nice. All he did was talk about himself. <laughs> I thought, well, so they only went out once. But after that, any time I'd be at a party and Zeppa was up from Palm Springs, he would introduce me to people saying, this is Steve. He and I dated the same girl, but he got further with her than I did. And, and you saw Aaron Fleming, you saw her naked one time. I don't understand why only these prurient things are... <laughs> well, welcome, welcome to the show, Steve. We could be talking about 
the way the humor of the Marx Brothers transcended vaudeville, Broadway, we'll come radio. Back to that. No. All right. I did. Aaron, Aaron, as I said, she was a very strange creature. <laughs> and Lord. there was one day when she said, I'm going to go sunbathing. I'm going to go floating in the pool. And I'm not going to be wearing anything. I don't want anyone to peek. All right. Is that clear? <laughs> it's like, oh, all right. So before she went outside, she went around the living room and opened up all of the drapes across the big giant windows that faced the pool, then put the raft in the pool and took off her bathing suit and was lying. You know, since then, I've been thinking, unfortunately, not face down in the pool, not, not like William Holden in Sunset Boulevard. <laughs> but she was lying face down. And I, you know, the truth is, I never was really drawn to her that way. She, she just, she had a, a, a coldness and a shrillness and something that just didn't make me crave her in that way. However, it was, you know, notable that she said, don't anybody peek, and then took off all her clothes and opened up all the windows so that she was on display for, you know, a half hour floating in the pool. And and I see that you're dumbstruck by this. Yes. yes. Now here's here's another story, and eventually I'll talk about Groucho Marx. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know where you're going with this one. This I heard a story like his uh Groucho's nurse or cook or something said something, and Aaron got became enraged and she said, Oh, are you a man? Oh, oh yes. yeah, that was Terry. Terry McCord was a wonderful nurse. His nurses were wonderful. They had his best interests at heart, and it was a very difficult balancing act for them and for me because we were trying to look after him and provide the best care we could, but she controlled the household, and so it was off with their heads if she got any sense of disrespect. So Groucho, this was this was – a couple of years after that other incident with the stroke, he had another small stroke, and Terry had said, don't you think we better call the doctor? You know, an outrageous request. This man has had a stroke. Shouldn't we call the doctor? And Aaron had just uh, flew into a rage and said, oh, you're in charge. You're going to wear the pants? You're the man of the house? And she unzipped her... You don't really want me to tell the rest of the story. Go right ahead. She... <laughs> But now a word from our alternates. She unzipped, uh, she had on a jumpsuit and she unzipped it and started fondling her pubic hair and saying, come on, Terry, I know you want to fuck me. You think you're the man here? Show me how, what a man you are. Fuck me. F and Terry, you know, understandably ran out of the house in tears. Uh, and then after, you know, after Aaron had won that round, she then picked up the phone and called the doctor and had an ambulance come. But it was just that that was the thing about Aaron was she I don't think she ever really accepted Groucho's mortality. I don't I don't mean death. I mean, the fact that he wasn't a, a superhero. I think she thought that if she yelled loud enough and and, you know, rattled him, it would shake the rust off of his brain and he would stop being an 86 year old man with with bad arteries who had had uh you know strokes and a heart attack and she and it would send his blood pressure soaring when she would be on the rampage and it it broke our hearts to watch this and now you know there's people now that say well I don't understand why you didn't interfere why didn't you call someone and it's very easy that that kind of monday morning quarterbacking because uh his son Arthur had had a lifelong estrangement off and on with his dad. They'd have good years and bad years. But that had been going on long before Aaron came on the scene and started alienating his old-time friends and family. So calling Arthur and saying Aaron Fleming is, is volatile and unpredictable, according to Aaron, if Arthur was in charge of Groucho, he would have put him in an old folks' home, and Groucho was terrified of that. Um... That's what happened to his friend Arthur Sheikman, and Groucho would say, I never want to go into one of those places like where Sheikman is. So we thought, well, if we call Arthur and he somehow uses whatever influence he has and then just puts Groucho in a home, what have we accomplished? Right. So it was a very def uh, delicate, difficult balancing act to try to 
stay true to you know my love and and devotion was always aimed at Groucho, but there was this you know, dragon guarding this fellow and you wanted to stay on her good side. I don't really know how I did it. There was an attempted coup in late 74 where we were going to remove her and substitute this other nurse named Connie who was young and attractive but who cared about Groucho and had a medical background so she would know how to treat him right instead of sending his blood pressure through the roof. And uh, the whole thing backfired um, and the night before it did, my phone, oh man, my phone rang in the middle of the night at UCLA and I hear this familiar breathy voice saying, I understand you're in on a plot to get rid of me. And oh. I thought, here is this woman who is paranoid and every now and again, paranoids are right. They are out to get them. And this was one of those cases. And I don't know how she found out and and more than that, I don't know how in the world I talked my way out of it because she was absolutely right. We were the household was conspiring and meeting behind her back to try to ease out Aaron and ease Connie in, and then bring in some of the friends who had been alienated while Aaron was in charge. And the whole thing exploded, and Aaron was in stronger control than ever until towards the end, uh, when there was this huge battle over Groucho between Arthur's forces and Aaron that ended up making a lot of headlines at the time. And um, she, Aaron hired, in her paranoia, she hired two private detectives to comb the house to see if there were any, she thought that there were electronic surveillance devices. That, I'm sure Arthur has had the house bugged. I'm sure he's had the telephones bugged. So they, they used the sophisticated electronic sweeping equipment and came in and said, we haven't found evidence of any kind of surveillance. However, we did find this. And they gave her these two baggies of syringes and traces of pills and, and that they found in the storm drain in front of Groucho's house. And one of the detectives said, what should we do with this? And of course, what any you know, a responsible person would do. She said, bury it in the backyard. So uh, they, instead of burying it, they went to the sheriff's department and said, we are conflicted here. This woman hired us to, to check out the house, and we found this. And instead of explaining what it was or saying she didn't know what it was, and in fact, I don't know that anyone ever found out that they were necessarily from Groucho's house because they could have washed down from another house, but she had said, bury them in the backyard, which alerted them. And that sure. began a criminal investigation. And uh, it, was, it, it was very strange being in the middle of this because I, I would know about it from being at Groucho's house. But all of a sudden, all of my friends are picking up the L.A. Times and reading these headlines. You know, nurse claims Aaron Fleming drugs Groucho, legendary comedian at the mercy of, you know, it's like, oh, man, the, it's like the shit had hit the fan. And, and you mentioned <clears throat> Arthur Sheikman, the great writer, mm -hmm. and we should mention his wife. Uh, oh, yeah, Gloria Stewart. Yeah, Gloria right. Stewart, the old woman from Titanic who tells the story of Titanic. Right. And to some of our fans, best known as Claude Rain's girlfriend That's right. in The Invisible Man. I could rule the world with an army of yes. invisible men. Yes. That funny you know, little like, hat. I always liked it. Did you know that Claude Rain's was a cockney and that beautiful voice was a put-on? Oh, wow. Oh, that's learned, interesting. I learned that for Dick Cavett told me that, that, that Claude Rains was born a Cockney, and, and that was an affectation in his career. Now, when you say he was a Cockney, did that mean oh, no. he liked to get shit on <laughs> under a glass <laughs> coffee table? Hey, how about that Danny Thomas? Isn't he something? <laughs> You know, Steve, since we're talking about sheep. Hey, what's the poop and, on Danny Thomas? And I heard that's why Claude Rains wanted to be invisible. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, God. Because oh, people God. would see him go, there's Claude Rains. He likes that, to get shit on. And, that, and then Bob Dylan wrote, it's a Claude Rains going to fall. <laughs> 
a friend of mine, Dennis Castanaris, wrote a song called "It's a Claude Rain's Gonna Fall," and it was a complete parody of the that eleven people will appreciate. That's funny. <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to Aaron because there's plenty more Aaron stuff, Steve. But tell us, uh, since you mentioned Sheikman coming up to sure. the house, and 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 uh, a lot of the the Marx Brothers writers. Maury Riskind, and then you met Nat Perrin. And, and Nat, Par- Perrin, Nat Perrin was wonderful. Tell us Nat about Perrin them. was one of Groucho's oldest friends. Uh, he co-wrote Monkey Business and Duck Soup. And he's, he figures prominently, if you've ever read the Groucho letters, there's a lot of to and fro from Nat Perrin, whom he called the deacon. Um, Nat, uh, I, t- I had told Nat that I was a huge fan of George Gershwin, and Nat said that when he was a kid, when he was a teenager, he was a huge fan of Gershwin's and that he had actually snuck into Eolian Hall in 1924, the night that George Gershwin debuted the Rhapsody in Blue. He snuck in the back way. And I just, I was just in awe of this guy. He, I think he was like 17 years old, but he was such a Gershwin fan. He wanted to be there for that. And he said, he said, then Groucho, Groucho brought me out to Hollywood in 1931 and he took me to a party, and there's George Gershwin at the Keys. And he brings me over, and he says, George, this is Nat Perrin. He's the only person I've ever met that can whistle the entire Rhapsody in Blue. <laughs> and, and Nat thought he was going to be put on the spot to have to stand there and whistle for 17 minutes. <laughs> but luckily, you know, Gershwin just kind of said, well, that's, you know, thank you, very nice, and I'm very flattered or something. And, and he was off the hook. But for a while, Nat was worried that he'd have to whistle Rhapsody in Blue. Now, was Nat the one, I, I forget now, who's the one who was uh, victimized by the House of Un-American Activities? Um... That was actually that wasn't one of the writers. That was Jerry Fielding, who was the original. He was the original band leader on "You Bet Your Life." Okay, uh, and he ended up having a fine career after that. He wrote a lot of uh, film and TV scores. He he scored a lot of Sam Peckinpah films and a lot of TV shows. And when I was working uh, uh, with Hector Arce on a book about "You Bet Your Life," that that Groucho also co-wrote. And we interviewed Jerry Fielding about that. And he said something that was, it put things into perspective. He said, people look at, but look at us, the people who were blacklisted, as, as heroes. He said, I look at, at kids today who are getting their skulls cracked with billy clubs and getting thrown in prison for anti-war protests and things like that. He said, all we did was lose our job. The guys today are the real heroes. It's interesting because everyone venerates the blacklisted people because of what they had to go through. But, uh, I mean, he, had a, he ended up working in Vegas after that where they didn't have the blacklist and ended up pulling himself back. Um, and I think Groucho ended up regretting not having interfered. But it was that whole Red Scare period of the 50s when I think pressure was put on Groucho from, from the sponsor that you know we've heard Jerry Fielding is a communist and by the way Fielding freely admitted that he was a communist it wasn't just again it wasn't paranoia he really was but he wasn't trying to overthrow NBC or Hollywood by conducting the you bet your life orchestra in a sinister way but uh, Groucho uh, he caved to the pressure and I think there was a rumor that they were trying to work their way up to him because he had been a lifelong liberal a lifelong Democrat and in those days, you couldn't help but rub shoulders with people who were, who were socialists and communists. And they, you know, again, they weren't out to overthrow the government. But when McCarthyism kicked in, anyone was uh, under suspicion that had that had hung out with those kind of people. Who else was at the house, Steve, from the from the the group of writers? I mean, you mentioned Nat Perrin, Maury Riskin, Perelman was there. Perelman was the yeah, and I was very nervous about meeting him because he was, you know, a legendary misanthrope. But I had such great admiration for him. And uh, again, I wasn't planning on, I didn't think I'd be there to meet him because he was coming back, uh, he was coming over for dinner and I thought I would be gone by then. And Aaron said, oh, Steve, why don't you stay and meet Sid? I'm sure he'd be thrilled to meet you. And I thought, I really should go home and change or something. I was in my usual tennis shoes, faded jeans and t-shirt and Perelman shows up impeccably dressed in a three-piece suit with some woman with a floor-length mink coat 
and two other people just with with the ritziest outfits you've ever seen. And there I am standing there saying, it's such an honor to meet you. And I'm thinking, he's probably thinking, who is this schmuck? But what happened was later on in the evening, some of the people were trying to trying to figure out which were Perelman lines from his films. And one of them said, oh, I shot an elephant in my pajamas. Wasn't that yours, Sid? No, that wasn't mine. Um, oh, vaccinated with a phonograph needle. You wrote that, didn't you, Sid? No, that was, I didn't write. And then I said, uh, the professor is waxing wroth. And he turned around, he looked at me and he said, that was one of mine. <laughs> From and, horse feathers. <laughs> yeah. That's a great and, one. And, and, and I, after dinner, um, Perelman took out a cigarette and he said to Groucho, uh, by the way, do you buy, by the way, incidentally, this is a dead on S.J. Perelman. Impression. <laughs> you get a lot of requests for that one, too. Oh, oh, yeah. The people stop me on the street. And they're not asking <laughs> me to do my Bennett surf impression. And they're saying, can you do that? And he so he he took out a cigarette and he said, uh, by the way, Groucho, do you mind if I smoke? And Groucho said, I don't care if you burn. <laughs> he said, that was good. That was good, Groucho. Let's try it for timing now. <laughs> and then I went back to my office, and Perelman went to use the restroom later on, and I, I stopped him on his way back and showed him that Groucho had had an early draft of horse feathers. And I said, have you seen this lately? And he said, no, and he started thumbing through it, and we started talking about the Algonquin Roundtable and Robert Benchley and all this, and he's advising me I should be a playwright because you, the writer has more control than in television and all this stuff. Wow. And I start hearing people saying, where's Sid? What happened to Sid? Is he sick? Is he okay? And it's like, gee, I had managed to corner S.J. Perelman for like 20 minutes talking about the round table. So there were these, you know, these nuggets of gold uh, that meant the world to me at the time. And then on reflection, realizing how fortunate I was. And the good thing was uh, for me was that since I was such a fanatic, I knew who all these people were. Uh, I don't know if you've had the experience of meeting someone and then years later someone explains to you why they were important and you go, oh, man, I wish I'd known that I would have asked them this or I would have told them this. In this case, when I would meet someone, my brain would – it's like my brain was a Rolodex that would flip to their card. Ah, Nat Perrin, okay, monkey business and duck soup. And, the, you know, you mentioned Gloria Stewart. The only time – uh, I wasn't able to retrieve the significance of a person was when Arthur Sheikman's wife would come over to lunch because Groucho only referred to, you know, Gloria Sheikman is coming for lunch. She's Arthur's wife. And I didn't realize that she was, in fact, Gloria Stewart uh, until after I'd stopped working there because I would love to have asked her about working with Karloff and James Whale, working oh, with Buzz right. Berkeley. Oh, that's right. She's in the old dark house, isn't she? Yes. Yeah. And Ernest Thessinger. Ernest Thessinger. It is my only weakness. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, you also said in the book that S.J. Perlman started playing with his pubic hair. Now, as- cut that out. <laughs> it wasn't his pubic hair. It was someone else's that he brought with him. He kept it for emergency purposes. <laughs> what, a, what about Zeppo and Gummo? We touched a little bit about Zeppo. And, and Gummo, who did not perform, was not a performing Marx brother, but was you read about him and people say he was funny. He was funny. Um, uh, Groucho had a tall, slender, blonde cook named Robin. And when Zeppo and Gummo were there for dinner, Zepp, you know, all the Marx brothers were fairly short. And Shiko was short of money, but I don't have to tell you. <laughs> anyway, uh, so Zeppo came out of the came out of the kitchen and sat down. He said, uh, "Robin said she'd marry me, but I don't know. I, I I think she's too tall for me." And and Groucho said, "What part of it do you want?" And Zeppo <laughs> said, "Well, uh, I'll take as high up as I can reach." And Gummo said, "What do you want with her feet?" <laughs> it's like, what, it was like a great surreal joke. The idea that he was so short that as high up as he could reach would have been her feet. So that's actually a very rare thing. People have stories about the other brothers. And, it, the, you know, there's that legend that off screen Zeppa was the funniest. Oh, sure. He, sure. he really did light up a room when he and, walked. And wasn't there a case where um, I think Groucho was sick? 
And oh, when he Z- has appendicitis. Yeah, and yeah. Zeppo took over for him. Yeah, on when stage. Animal, Animal Crackers was a Broadway show before it was a film, and then it toured. And there was uh, at one point Groucho got an appendicitis and had to be hospitalized. So Zeppo pinch hit for him a couple of nights. And the report that came back was that he matched Groucho laugh for laugh on all the lines, and people did not realize that that was not Groucho Marx in front of them. I guess Zeppo's role in the play wasn't substantial enough that anyone was saying, I don't understand, where's the guy, where's Zeppo? But Groucho ended up coming back to the show before his doctor would like him to have because he felt a little bit threatened by the fact that his kid brother was able to was able to sub for him and nobody was the wiser. And I um I remember hearing oh um uh, I I spoke to like Maxine Marx about uh-huh. three times and she had told me that when she was a little girl she watched them a bunch of times and it was unimportant to watch the Marx Brothers. Chick- Chico's daughter, we should point out, right. what you're talking about. And, and she was, ran, ran outside and was playing while they were on stage. And afterwards, uh, Chico said to her, did you catch it? And she goes, what? And Chico and Harpo switched characters on stage. Oh, right, right. And and she missed it because she was out playing. Yeah, yes, she told that story. She was great. She was a character, and she had, she had those sad eyes and that sideways smile. And she would she would smile and look at you, and it was eerie because it was like Chico and Drag was looking at you. <laughs> yes, she she looked. Oh, the only thing missing was the hat. Yeah, and I I remember my greatest moment with her was she mentioned Al Sheehan, the Marx Brothers uncle. Right. And who was a great vaudevillian. Gallagher and Sheen. And, right. And, yeah. And I said to her, when she mentioned Al Sheehan, I went, absolutely Mr. Gallagher. And she grabbed my hand and shook it. And she said, uh, positively Mr. Sheen. Ah, uh, what a great moment. I, I felt like it was like I was in a time machine. Yeah. And went back. Yeah. It's hard to describe what, what a great feeling that, and that boy, that was a great, the, this part, one of the lyrics of the song was, uh, a baby born as black as ink, weighed a half a pound. I think how could anything be so dark and be so light? Can you imagine releasing that today? Uh, I don't, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no this. And, and I heard that uh, Gallagher and Sheen, they were being sued at one point. Uh, that I think Ziegfeld said, uh, we need them for this show, and they backed out. And, and Gallagher and Sheen went to court to prove they were a terrible untalented team <laughs> that were completely worthless. I never heard that yes, story. It's great. Yeah, they, they had to go prove they were awful and didn't so by, have a shred of talent. So in, in order to win, they had to lose. <laughs> yes. <laughs> did he did he watch the old films? Did he put them on, uh, Steve? Did he did he did you guys sit in and, and reminisce? Did, and it was a great, yeah, and that was great. It's sort of like in Ed Wood when uh, when Martin Landau and Johnny Depp are sitting there watching White Zombie and he's mm-hmm. talking to him about it. It was like that with sitting with Groucho watching it because he'd be telling you behind the scenes stories. Or uh, You Bet Your Life had been resyndicated in the 70s. And so he would watch that. It was on 11 o'clock each night and he would be watching it and he would get he would get upset when the contestants wouldn't get it, he'd say, they, they should have known that. That was an easy question. There's no excuse for not knowing <laughs> that. But he would, and there was one time he came to the lunch table and, and he, he, just, he seemed irritated and he just said, um, whatever made Bazell think he could direct? And, and now Eddie Bazell oh, had, at the circus. had directed at the oh. circus and Go West, yeah. which are two of the weaker, weakest yeah. Marx Brothers films. But the idea that it was as if Groucho had just come from the set of Go West and was angry all over again that Bazell, who had been a vaudevillian years earlier and then became a sort of contract director at MGM. And then I had, a, I had an experience with Bazell that was one of those cases where, where sometimes you don't phrase something right and it comes out wrong. 
uh, at the time I'd become friends with Eleanor Powell, the tap dancer from, from MGM musicals. And Bazell had directed a couple of her films. So he was at one of Groucho's parties. Uh, I mean, obviously Groucho's resentment at the job Bazell did didn't preclude not inviting him to some of his parties. So I went over and I started talking to Bazell and I said, um, you know, I've seen uh, all the pictures you did with, with her except for Honolulu. That's a hard picture to see. And he said, well, you know, back then pictures were different and audiences were di- and he And I realized that he thought I meant it's a hard film to watch. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, my God, he, he thought, that who is this little shit walks up to me and says, I'm so pleased to meet you. I can't sit through your movies. So I, I bent over backwards to explain to him that I meant, no, it's a hard movie to find to see. But I felt terrible that he mis- misinterpreted that. And and he said something that Groucho answered. I forget. They, he said something about Groucho as an actor. Oh, yeah. oh, that was uh, Sam Wood was the director on oh, on uh, oh, right at the uh, opera. opera day at the races, and uh, and after one take, Sam Wood said, "I can't make an actor out of Marx," and Groucho said, "Nor a director out of Wood." <laughs> Because he, I mean, Sam Wood was not known for being a skilled comedy director, you know. Now, now this is very important. Uh oh. Eleanor Powell, yes. I think her son starred in the movie The Beast Within. She, Eleanor Powell <laughs> wow. was married. Eleanor Powell was married to Glenn Ford. She said she had her pick of anyone on the entire tree at MGM, and she got stuck with the lemon. <laughs> so it did not. He was not the most faithful husband, but they did have a son named um, Peter Ford, and uh, I guess if if he was in that film, that's who. Is it that who you're been. thinking of, Glenn Ford's son? Oh, Peter Ford. Oh, hmm. I will see. Well, we will have to look up the Beast okay. Within. We'll put our staff on that. Did he talk other specifics? I know he was raging about Bazell, which is funny, Steve. But did he talk about Margaret Dumont? Did he talk about? You know, is, Edgar yeah, Kennedy. Did he reminisce he, about specific people that he'd worked with? Is it true that Groucho once said, I used to have Margaret Dumont <laughs> take a shit on me <laughs> <laughs> when, when, I lied, when I lied underneath <laughs> a coffee table that I borrowed? <laughs> From Danny Thomas. Oh, it's Jump the Shark again. <laughs> it's absolutely not true. It was not a coffee table. It was a settee. There you go. I'm glad to set the record straight after all these years. Thelma Todd <laughs> once shit on me. Hot toddy. <laughs> but, <Yeah. laughs> but, she, <laughs> but, <laughs> but she put a tablecloth. <laughs> So it killed the whole point. She, she was very formal that way. <laughs> we, should, we should point out to our listeners who don't know this that we're looking at Steve on Skype, and he's turning several different shades. Please pick one you like. We have of, we have fuchsia, we have mauve. He's, he's a fuchsia, Macintosh. I think fuchsia's coming up in a minute. Yeah, not a Macintosh. <laughs> No, uh, Nat, Nat Pendleton. Did he <laughs> once took a shit on me while I was sleeping in my trailer? <laughs> oh Lord, Sig Ruman. <laughs> I was just going to ask about Sig Ruman. <laughs> once, well, I'll answer that. Sig Ruman would eat a lot of German sausage. <laughs> And then he would shit on me. <laughs> Gilbert, I don't want you to hold back. You can ask oh. me anything. <laughs> really, go ahead. I have no shame. Okay. <laughs> we were talking about Groucho, I think. <laughs> did, did he ever comment on Skidoo, something that Gilbert and I uh, love to talk about on this show? No, no, he did not comment on Skidoo. I think it became more of a... a a cult favorite after he was gone. And uh-huh. so I don't, there was nothing there, but you know, it was fun. It was, it was fun watching him deal with interviewers when they would come out and ask him about 
you know, asking about the films and the old days and stuff. And he really, he did not suffer fools gladly. And it used to frustrate me because I would think, you know, if I were, if I got the assignment to come interview Groucho, I would do my homework and I would know the answers to a lot of these things. But to them, it was just an assignment. It's like, go out to 1083 Hillcrest and talk to Groucho about this. And I remember, well, I mean, one guy said, what are you doing with your time? And Groucho said, I'm wasting it talking to you. That didn't make it into his, in the guy's piece. <laughs> and another guy said, how has filmmaking changed since the days when you're, you and your brothers? And Groucho said, <clears throat> they didn't used to have toilets near, <laughs> the sound, near the sound stages, but all that's changed now. And the guy said, really? How has it changed? And Groucho just looked at him and said, people don't piss anymore. <laughs> like, what do you think it meant? It meant that now they have restrooms near the soundstage. So it was great fun. And, of course, these things never made it into the guy's finished pieces because it reflected poorly on them. Now, um, now, Groucho, I mean, this is weird. It's a case of the Mox Brothers meet the Bowery Boys. I know what you're going to say. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Kay Gorsi. Groucho's second wife was Kay Gorsi, who had been married to Leo Gorsi of the Dead End Kids, East Side Kids, Bowery Boys, depending on which incarnation. And they had a horribly abusive, alcoholic, knockdown, drag out marriage. So she divorced Leo Gorsi. She actually was the friend of Groucho's older daughter, Miriam. And and they had gone to school together, and Miriam brought Kay over uh, after school one day, and Groucho and Kay hit it off, and then Miriam said it, it soon Kay would come over and go right past my bedroom and go into my dad's room. And so Kay and Groucho got married, and they, they begat uh, Mac, uh, Melinda, who was uh, Groucho's last child born in the mid-late 40s. But uh, yes, they, there's the the Leo Gorsi connection, um, which is a the, Paul Williams song. <laughs> <laughs> the Leo, Leo Gorsi connection. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> uh, One day we'll find it, the Leo Gorsi connection. <laughs> oh, heavens. Now, is it true no. that Hunts Hall would come yes. over Groucho's house and go, oh, <laughs> oh, I'm going to take a shit oh, on you. Oh, stop that. <laughs> I'm detecting a fixation here that is not in evidence when you talk to Lorraine Newman. <laughs> Thanks for listening, Steve. Sure. So, so, so to, to wrap it, let, let's at least explain what became of Erin and what became of the conservatorship when she, her team went up against uh, Arthur's team in court. And you were called in to give a, dep a deposition, yeah, we might add. I ended up giving a three-day deposition, which was really scary because it was in this Century City high-rise, and I'd never done it before. And still, uh, I remember the, uh, the attorney said, have you ever been deposed before? And I said, I've never even been elected, which, which wasn't bad considering I was trying not to wet my pants. And uh, at one point, I remember at one point, uh, Aaron's, Aaron's lawyer was trying to make, uh, make the case that Groucho loved Aaron deeply. And, uh, and I was trying to explain the difference between loving and being in love. And he said, well, I, I'm... I'm, I'm trying to understand the distinction here. And he sets up this hypothesis. He said, suppose you and I go out, uh, we go to a bar and we're having a few beers and he spends all this time. And I said, well, that really, that couldn't happen. I said, why not? He, he said, why not? And I said, I don't really like beer. And he blew up and he said, Mr. Stolier, if you would quit ad libbing, we might actually finish this. And I said, are you implying that I should prepare my answers ahead of time? That was the only time I got through. It reminded me of, of Robert Benchley's Take the Witness, where he imagines himself being this brilliant, clever guy on the witness stand and then falling apart in reality. But uh, anyway, yes, so I did a deposition. Aaron ended up losing, and uh, Nat Perrin was Groucho's conservator temporarily, and then because he, poor Nat, was being whipsawed by the Aaron 
by Aaron Fleming on the one hand and then Arthur on the other. He was getting calls day and night. I, I was I was actually in charge of the house on weekends and staying there, having to referee these two factions. Um, it was an incredible responsibility, but I was happy to do it for Groucho. And Aaron, Aaron was in court. Uh, her craziness was coming out. She was. She was sued by the B of A for having, you know, it, uh, uh, taken advantage of Groucho financially. And there was a scene where, where the bailiff was uh, trying to check her purse as she went into the courtroom. And she was screaming, give me back my purse. Give me my purse. You bitch. You bitch. And the and the the judge is gaveling her into silence. And then Aaron's attorney, who was, uh, he was sort of like, his name was Mr. Sabi. And he was sort of like an Israeli Chico. <laughs> and he, he was standing there trying to plead, saying, you, you see, Your Honor, my, my client does not, uh, is not really a, in a position where she can answer the, and, and, uh, the judge said, do you think you're going to be able to testify, Miss Fleming? And Aaron said, I'm fine. You may have a problem, Your Honor. This is not the best way to get on the good side of a judge who's trying to decide the case. Yeah. You can see hey, the so, footage of that on YouTube. You can see the, the yeah. clips from the trial. And, yeah. and you, there was a great line Groucho said, really, in his last days. Oh, he, yeah. He yeah. was, see, when... Uh, I. I, I would keep thinking as he was fading out, I would think, well, I guess the word play is gone. You know, I mean, but that dates back to when I first saw him in 72. It was one man show at the Dorothy Chandler and he was so old and frail. And I thought, well, I'm sure he he only has a few months to live. And then I ended up working for him for the last three years of his life. And it was always very reassuring when he would uh, twist a line and hand it back to you. Uh, he, he always... He he kept up with what was happening in Hollywood with the trade papers, um, and he came to the lunch table one day and he said, "Wonderful bunch of mail you brought me. Nothing but requests for money." And I said, "But you got a variety, didn't you?" And he said, "Yes, a variety of requests for money, which was very gra and gratifying." The, the but then, nurse, yeah, go ahead. But when so even towards the end, when he was drifting in and out of lucidity. Um, he was in the hospital, uh, you know, on his deathbed, sleeping, and the nurse came by and woke him up. He said, what do you want? And she said, I'm here to see if you have a temperature. And he said, don't be silly. Everyone has a temperature. And he fell back asleep. <laughs> 98.6. That's great. <laughs> and, so, and so even to the end. And what, ha I mean, uh, Aaron fell to a horrible end. Yes. She did. She was in and out of psych units. Uh, people would say, you know, her her lucidity was contingent on whether she was on her meds or not, because she really was. She really was uh, uh, schizophrenic. She was, you know, it isn't just I'm not just, you know, throwing labels out saying she was a crazy woman. But she was a crazy woman. She was homeless for a while. She was in and out of psych units. And then. Um, Wasn't she telling people that Laurence Olivier was her uh, her father at one point? And right, and she was signing letters. Uh, Aaron Fleming Guccione, implying that she had married penthouse publisher Bob Guccione. Yeah, she yeah. ran into yeah. she ran into uh, um, Larry Gilbert's wife, wasn't Gilbert's it? Gilbert's wife, yeah. yeah, and and was talking about the Pacific Design Center, and said. That was designed by my father, you know, which in and of itself is already off the off the charts. You know who my father was, don't you? And Pat Gelbart said no. And she said, Why, Laurence Olivier, of course. And it's like it's it's like someone you would think would walk around with their hand in their shirt like Napoleon, but she really was so sadly in in uh August of two thousand three she killed herself. She I don't know how she had a gun living, staying in the board and care facility she was living in, almost directly under the Hollywood sign. It sounds hokey, and it sounds like I'm exaggerating it to make it more dramatic. But here's this woman who wanted to be a famous actress. Then she hitched her wagon to Groucho's star and sort of carefully built bridges and then set fire to them and spiraled downward after he died and ended up killing herself in the shadow of the Hollywood sign. 
I got to tell you, Steve, you see those YouTube clips, the ones uh, specifically of her on the Cavett show. Gil, have you seen yeah. this? Oh, my when, God. When Groucho yes. brings her out, yes. she's chastising Dick for for uh, leaving her in the lurch in a play or something. But you could see the poor thing. You could see that she's kind of unhinged even then. And that was years before she got bad. But the day that she lost the court case, Ted Koppel had her on Nightline. And it's one of the most surreal things I mean, he's trying to ask serious questions, and she's got this wild look in her face. And he's, you know, oh, uh, Aaron, you've been uh, hit with a $500,000 uh, fee. Uh, 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 do you have that kind of money? I was going to borrow it from you, Ted. Well, but seriously, Aaron, uh, I was going to put it on my MasterCard, Ted. Well, and she kept trying to turn it over to to poor Mr. Sabi, her attorney. He would say, what's next for you, uh, Aaron? Well, my attorney, Mr. Sabi. Well, I'd love to talk to Mr. Sabi under other circumstances, but I'm trying. And it was just this, she had this wild look in her eyes and, and the camera's pushing in and she's saying, you know, I know that I'll be completely exonerated because there's no truth to any of, and this was after the jury had come in with their verdict against her. So, you know, a very troubled woman, very sad. And I have compassion for people that have psychological problems, but don't put them in charge of a frail old man. And, you know, that, that's where my loyalty ends, is watching the, the verbal and emotional abuse that she inflicted on him, even as she lengthened his life. And, and you left out one important part of the story. That's where the next day... <laughs> No, you see, you're, after, you're screwing it up. You should do it straight. Groucho said. Yes, what did he say? Tell me, tell me. You know, what did he say? You know, Ted Koppel likes to come over the house and shit on me. Now, that part's true. Yes, see? See, the other I, stuff wasn't I'm ashamed true. of you for leaving it out. So, so Steve, he, uh, Groucho yes, finally sir. passes away in, in August, and he has, the for the first time in his career, he has bad timing because he passes away in the same week as Elvis. I will never forgive Elvis Presley for dying when he did. Um, because He died three days before Groucho died. and uh, I remember. And of course, and, and it ended up being something along the lines of, um, and this just handed to us, comedian Groucho Marx of the legendary Marx Brothers uh, has died today at the age of 86. We'll have more continuing coverage on the death of Elvis Presley after these messages. And didn't and, I, I heard, well, I mean, they both worshipped him, so both Dick Cavett and Woody Allen yeah, got really They wrote really letters angry. to Time Magazine that to the effect of was it our imagination or was there short shrift given to the death of Mr. Marx compared to Elvis? I mean, you know, it would be silly to try to diminish Presley's importance in pop culture. But the, I mean, my, the point I make in Raised Eyebrows is that there are, were other kings on other thrones and it, it, it was too bad, really, yes, that, that Frank, as Frank said, Groucho, for the first time, Groucho's timing was lousy because people were still reverberating from the, the idea that, that uh, the king had left the building in a big way. There was that one late-night tribute. Was it on, uh, on, uh, on ABC? Mm. There, was a, uh, there was a tribute to Groucho. They put together some of Cabot's old clips. Right. And uh, that was very shortly after. And, you know, I, that, I had started corresponding with Cabot at the time, and I was worried that just because that, that now that Groucho was gone, the, the pipeline to Groucho's house was severed and there would no, be no reason for Dick to stay in touch with me. And instead, he called me from New York a couple of days after Groucho died, and he said, uh, listen, I hope just because Groucho's gone, we're not going to lose touch. And by the way, I've shown some of your letters to Woody, and he says they're very well written. And I had to empty the urine out of my shoes, the one two punch. Of, <laughs> and we, you know, we stayed friends. And he, <clears throat> excuse me, he hired me to write for him uh, to come to New York in 82. And I had many zany adventures with Dick Cavett in Manhattan before moving back to L.A. Well, he's the best. He was our first guest on this show. He was great. That was a great show. And uh, I'm glad. I'm glad that once these things are done, they exist and can be, you know, tapped into again for future reference. 
And there's a sweet section of the book, and you just have to tell us, too. In 2009, uh, you and a couple of comedy writers, actually one that I know, uh, Guy Nicolucci, you went right, back. Mike, you, Mike Rowe was the and other. Mike Rowe, we know Mike, too. You went back to the old house, and it was, uh, it was kind was of— a, It was a very dreamlike, surreal experience because the place had been very heavily reworked, uh, not just cosmetically, but structurally. Uh, and I, it was very strange walking through the house. I felt like, like a blind psychic walking down a hallway, and I would gesture with my hand and say, that wall wasn't there, this was a door, that wall was a room, and it was very, very strange to, to be back in this. It was and it wasn't the same house. And I felt like, uh, I felt like Rod Taylor in the time machine. It's like I was occupying the same space in a different time with different surroundings. It had all been changed over the years. Was it, it, was, it must have been sad. It was just, it was, it wasn't sad so much as just strange. It was, it, it was really, it wasn't wonderful and it wasn't sad. It was just like, it really was like a dream, like, or like I was a ghost haunting an old house. Oh, we should sing together. Uh oh. Um, hello, I must be going. Hello. Yeah, now don't make the mistake of singing, hello, I must be garing and bringing the Nazis <laughs> in. So why don't you each sing a part separately? Okay. <laughs> hello. I must be going. I cannot stay. I came to say I must be going. I'm glad I came, but just the same. I must be going. I'll stay a week or two. I'll stay the summer through. But I am telling you. I must be going. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> oh. This will be available only on eight tracks. <laughs> From Kate's Hell. Steve, this was great. Thank you. Did, was my book mentioned at all? Oh, in the sorry. <laughs> we did it in the intro. Let's get the plug in, for Let's. God's sake. The book okay. is Steve Stolyer. And the book. Yes. And the book is Raised Eyebrows, My Years Inside Groucho's House. We were having so much fun, we forgot to give you the plug. And yeah. what's the status of the movie, by the way? The status of the movie is uh, I wrote the initial draft of the screenplay, and Oren Moverman is polishing it, and it's in pre-production, and... Um, and uh, Rob Zombie is going to be directing it. I mean, it's a whole separate story, but I guess we're out of time, as they say. But uh, how he and I came together as a, the strangest Hollywood couple since Ernest Borgnine proposed to Ethel Merman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if only I knew somebody that could do a convincing old Groucho, Steve. I could, I could recommend him for the part. Yeah, well, yeah. You know, I often thought that Gilbert would make a great uh, Oscar Levant. <laughs> Do you want to wow. know something? Oh, wow. This is so weird. Of old people, when I was on Saturday Night Live, yes. um, Gene, I think Gene Domanian yes. said to me that I should star in like the Oscar Levant story. So once every 35 years, someone comes <laughs> yes, up. Yes, exactly. That's it. That's it. <laughs> and, and is it true that Groucho said, <laughs> oh, no. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> okay, we've been talking to Steve Stolyer, the author of Raised Eyebrows, My Years Inside Groucho's House. Soon to be a major motion picture. And uh, I'm Gilbert Gottfried. This is Gilbert Gottfried's amazing, colossal podcast with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre. A.K.A. Fenneman. Uh, yes. <laughs> that's, this is so funny. Um, Frank said to me when we started this, he said, well, I'm pretty much your George Fenneman. <laughs> <laughs> Not George Fenement. Yes. No, that was Groucho's nickname. Fenneman was right. a great guy, and it, and you could do a lot worse than being Groucho's George, Fen or being Gilbert's George Fenneman. You could have been Gilbert's Don Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> I'll count my blessings, Steve. Thanks. Can I, can I tell you? I mean, yeah. I know we've gone over. Can I tell That's you okay. what Don 
Don Cavett told me that when Don Wilson was on his PBS show, he wanted to strangle him because Wilson would tell long stories that would all end with, and as you could imagine, Jack made great comic capital of that. <laughs> And when he had no punchlines, only lengthy setup. <laughs> Steve, you're a great mimic. Thank you. Let us know when you're in New York. I'd love to hear your Frank Nelson. Oh, would you? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for doing the show. Thank My you, pleasure. Steve. Thanks for having me we'll on. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye. 